everybody. This is Brandon Wineline. I'm your host, and uh, this is season two, episode three. I have my co-host, guest co-host for the evening, Mr. James Davini from the Dirty and Driven podcast. How are you, sir? Howdy ho. Good to be back on the old On Grade podcast. Glad to have you back, man. So we're having the reunion tour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had Colton on last time, you're on this time. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Bring all the magic tool bus back, baby. Hey, man, man, we're gonna. I was talking to Colton about that. I said we gotta do that over the summer, this yeah, summer again, yeah. like we, we did last year. Yeah, we got to get back up together and do some stuff, man. That was that was a fun episode, and just fun hang. Yeah, um, you and I were talking for about fifteen minutes before the episode, and we had a great conversation. And something that we deal with in construction all the time is our government. And uh, you want going into detail, kind of about what you. And now we're talking about, you know, with uh, seeing how the cities operate and the state government and all that. Yeah, dude, it's interesting that you brought that up because you were talking about an episode that I had recorded, uh, one of our last ones we did, episode 81 or 82, behind the political curtain is what we called it. But, you know, uh, last month I spent a day up at the state capitol of Oklahoma and we got to... I mean, I rubbed elbows with all the top guys in the state other than the governor himself, but the lieutenant governor, um, senators, congressmen, uh, director of tourism, a lot of these people that, you know, to most people, they're just headlines. You know what I mean? Like you just see them in the headlines, but uh, really got to learn the inner workings of what was going on there. And you, you gain a certain respect for it in some lights of – Hey, this is actually things that they're doing really well. And you learn a lot more about the process. And then you also learn about, you know, things that you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. The headlines were right about that, you know, but, uh, uh, and then today I was, I was with the, the city government here in Ponca city, Oklahoma, and did the same thing, but on, on a local level. And I work with those guys, you know, it's like you're saying in construction, <sighs> Oh, so many people in this business, especially if you're trying to scale and you're trying to be a legit contractor and you're trying to be a guy that's getting, you know, big jobs, city jobs, state jobs, you know, you're trying to get above private work or get out, you know, from grading driveways, but you're trying to really do some big sizable jobs where you know you're going to get paid. Uh, it's good to know these people. I mean, you can think what you want about them and, and believe me, I think what I want about some of them, but they're the people who are ultimately going to pay your bills if you're trying to trying to do something, you know? So it's good to good to get in there and learn about some of these guys and, and build relationships with them because they're, they're the ones who ultimately are, are going to be putting money in your pocket and into your company if you get their jobs. Yeah, it's, it's really crazy the way you were talking about that because, you know, Oklahoma's laws and Texas laws are pretty similar. Um, yeah in regards to construction rules and stuff like that. I know the retainage rules are actually better in Oklahoma than they are in Texas. Do, do um, state jobs in Texas, um, do they hold retainage? Yeah. Really? Yeah, 10%. On every state job? Mm -hmm. 10 wow. and uh, ten for private, 10 for 5% for government. I think highway, I think highway is 5, maybe 10. Wow. I don't know, it might be 10. Wow. Yeah, see, our, yeah. our state does not hold retainage on our jobs. Our city does. They hold five. City does. Yeah, they hold 5%, but the state doesn't. But now a state, if we are working for a contractor, if we're the sub doing the asphalt, um, whoever we're working under, they have the right to hold up to 10% retainage, but they have to pay it out within two weeks of them getting paid for that work. Okay, so that's similar to us. Then, yeah, it's 10% here. 10 days, 10 bit. So roughly two weeks, like you said, but 10 business days, um, which a lot of people don't know this for anybody that works in the state of Texas by Texas law, it's actually seven days. It's not 10. They'll tell you that and they'll put it in a contract, but it's actually seven. So huh. if anybody ever tries to tell you it's 10 days, um, I don't know the code, but you can actually look it up. And I had to do this a couple of times because they tried pulling that. Oh, well we've sent it. I'm like, yeah, well you're at 10 days already, you know, and, you got seven days to pay me and technically you can start charging interest, but you yeah. wanted to. Now the yeah. private guys, the GCs and 
I know this is a little off topic, but dude, GCs, like building GCs, they just know how to piss me off just right. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> they hold, get PhDs in it, man. They hold 10% retainage, and they'll hold it till the end of the job, not whenever you finish your work. They hold it till the end of the job, and you're like, dude, I laid that parking lot a year ago. It ain't my fault. And then they want you to warranty it another year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, so you want me to warranty two years is what you're saying, even though the manufacturer I just got this from won't even do it. Yeah, I've started telling them, dude, I don't mind if you hold retainage, but you better pay it out within two weeks of our final, our final pay app. Like, we better get it paid after that. Like, that's ridiculous. We, we had one, it was a small parking lot, dude. It was, it was a $40,000 parking lot and it was not a very big building. It just happened. This is the first time I've ever got to file a lien on somebody. And they kept telling us, nope, we're not paying you your retainage. And it's only four grand. You know, like, it's not breaking the bank, but it's coming up in agent. We're like, we're not going to get paid for that. Like, that's our profit for the job. You know what I mean? So, like, you know, we don't want to do it for free or break even on it. So, we're, like, sitting there like, well, we're coming up on 90 days, so we better file a lien on them. So, um, they kept telling us, we're not going to pay you until you get a certificate of occupancy. And we're like, what does our parking lot have to do with your certificate of occupancy? Nothing. And they're like, no, nah, that's just the rules. And I was like, your contract said you're going to be done December 31st, and it's March something. And I'll tell you what, you want to get paid, you follow a lien, and people tend to pay pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. the other problem that you have is – I'm. I don't know how it is in Oklahoma, but I've seen it happen here. Um, and it actually happened to us um, like two and a half, three years ago. We we're doing a job at an airport, Meacham Airport in Fort Worth. I'm not going to go into detail on the client, but the area, at least so people have a reference. But um, the GC went bankrupt. Mm. So the owner finished the job themselves. And, um, the scope that we had done previously they weren't going to pay us for because they had paid the GC. Hmm. So I said, okay, well, that's not my problem because I didn't get paid. So we could prove that we never got paid for that. <clears throat> so they had us go after the bonding company. Well, we still follow the lien. Well, all they did was bond the lien. Huh? So they get their CO. Now the bonding company did pay us, but it took like almost seven eight months after they got their co before we got our money wow. now we did get paid you know the rest of our scope by them so they did pay us that but you know they kept telling us they're like hey uh you know they tried playing this game i don't know if this ever happened to you they started playing that game of oh well you know if you don't take this lien off we're not going to pay you now it's like i ain't got nothing to do with that lien that lien's for the stuff i've already done this is for work i've done under your because i signed a contract with them right it's like this is the work I've done for you. You know, they're like, well, you still got a lien. I'm like, I, I, I'm not taking it off because I'll never see my money. So, you know, yeah, like, it's games they try to play, you know, it's I mean, all games, man. It's all games. Or it's literally just some person at a desk that is like a secretary or something. And their boss said, here's what to do. And they don't know because you know there's the pre lien release and then there's the lien release you know that a lot of them make you fill out so the pre lien is like just for people that don't know that's one that you fill out and you say when you pay me that call it ten thousand dollars you owe me when i get paid that ten thousand dollars i won't file a lien and then you file a lien release which is i've been paid ten thousand dollars i'm not going to file a lien so the pre just says upon receiving payment i can't lien against you and then mm -hmm. And then you do the other one. So it's fun. And it's a fun game trying to get paid sometimes. It really is. It's, um, you and I have talked about this offline a bunch, but it almost gets to the point you want to work for about five or six people. That's about it. You know, you don't really want to pursue work with anybody else because you don't know anymore. Mm -hmm. And some I wanted to talk about, you were talking about retainage, but you're talking about the contract that you were just dealing with. Did I tell you about what happened to me this week? Uh-uh. You got to love this story. So we had a rain day yesterday. And so I worked in the office. And so I'm in the office. And before I get in the office, I went out to check a couple jobs. I'm going to rain out, but I just wanted to go look and see how bad it was. So I get to the office, and I get an email on my phone as I'm pulling in. It's from 
a GC that we're getting ready to start a little demolition job for for a school district. And I never heard of these guys, but I check them out. They've been around for like 45 years, but I'm like, that, that don't add up. You've been around 45 years, but I never heard of you. And um, so I send, they had sent the contract last week and they wanted it back by like April 10th or something. So I sent it back Friday with corrections. And my normal, I just literally take the proposal that Pete makes. I take the contract that they've got and I go down to the scope and I literally go line for line. And if it matches everything, I don't touch it. Mm -hmm. But two things they always try to get you on, I notice, and you might know what I'm talking about. They always try to get you on mobilizations. They always try to get you on uh, LD. They always try to get you on um, uh, like traffic control. Like I know in paving, you guys have to have it, but like with us, there's sometimes, dude, I'm, I'm literally cutting a curb and they want me to put like full traffic control out. And it's like, well, I'm not going out in the middle of the street, man. Like, yeah. if, you know, I'm doing a tie in on utility work. Yeah. I'm going to need traffic control. But most of the time, what I try to do is I go, well, Hey, how many subs are you going to need to do whatever it is that you need traffic control for? And they go, well, we're going to have the utility guy, you concrete guy. Then we got to bring a paving guy in. Cause he's got to pave it before we put concrete on it. And I'm like, okay, why don't y'all just get it for everybody? Yeah. Because everybody's going to take that traffic control, mark it up 20%. And, you know, you're just losing money at that point. And so it's like the light bulb finally comes on for some of these guys. And they're like, oh, well, that's going to affect my bonus. Oh, well, I should probably do something about that. But I had a, he literally um, sends me the contract back. And all the corrections that I made, he says, will not accept, will not accept, will not accept, will not accept, will not accept. So I go, okay. So I sent it back with, he sent it back in red. was, you know, I'm not going to make this correction. I'm not going to make, so I sent it back in green. And I says, well, you know, not going to sign the contract if you won't make these corrections. And he goes, why? I says, well, these corrections are made based off of a proposal that was sent to your company. It's five pages. It is broken down Barney style. Like, if you can't accept these changes, you know, I can't do the job. He's like, well, we really want to, you know, we'll we'll write a change order if we need to do that for these things. And I'm like, he's like, but I'm not changing the wording in the contract. I'm like, I'm not doing it. So that's something I, you know, we were going to talk about PM work stuff today. That's something that it stinks. The thing is, they're a brand new client. We've never worked for them before. If it's somebody I worked for before, I'll be like, okay, yeah, you know. I might have never worked with this project manager, but I worked with this company. You know, they're good for it. Yeah. But I never worked for this company. So it was like, okay, no, I'm not, we're not going to play this game, dude. So if you can't even, that told me right off the bat, and this is something I want for the listeners, and you might agree with me on this, James. If they're fighting you that much about simple contract corrections, how bad is it going to be when you're out on the job and something serious goes on and you do need to get a change order or you do need a favor or, you know, you need a little more time to handle some, are they going to immediately start hitting you with, you know, LD? Are they going to, you know, are they going to even work with you? You know, yeah. if, if they don't make contract corrections, what kind of guys are you dealing with? I literally just ran into that a few months ago. I talked about it on my show a little bit and um, we're actually working with that GC again on another project and we had to really lay down the law because in our area, dude, we're the only people who do asphalt. I mean, there's nobody else. You, I mean, you might be able to get an out of town guy to come, but most of them are going to look and say, no, we stay out of that territory because that's Evan's territory. And some of them sometimes will call and they'll want to buy asphalt from us or whatever, but it's just so hard because they're either hauling asphalt from an hour and a half, two hours away, which is makes it damn near impossible to do a parking lot or something like that because it's cold by the time it gets to the job or they just, they don't want to piss us off, frankly. Um, so there's times where we go, we're your only option. And we, we, we try not, we try to leave this in the back pocket. You know what I mean? Like, like I, not an arrogant person, not an arrogant company, just, Hey, uh, you know, you need us. Okay. So you better work with us. We work with you. We're very laid back people. 
We'll do whatever it takes to get the job done and to make sure everybody's satisfactory, make sure we're on schedule, make sure the budget's good. We're not going to change order you to death. I mean, we'll help you out even if you need help doing some, some little stuff. Like, we don't mind. We'll work with you, but don't screw us over. And mm-hmm. if you're going to nitpick us to death, I mean, we just ran into that, dude. We worked for a GC that this was one of their first jobs. They were a company out of out of state but then they opened an office here in oklahoma somewhere and it just was a it was a cluster they didn't know what they were doing they didn't know how to schedule a project they kept telling us they were ready whenever we drive up there and you know they most certainly were not ready for us and we told them our stipulations they'd keep telling us well we're working nights and weekends and we're doing this and that we're gonna have it ready for you by monday and we'll come monday they're not ready and then they're sitting there trying to tell us well well, you, you said you'd be here this date. And we're like, you said you'd be ready. And, you know, they're trying to slap us with, well, if we go beyond schedule, it's your fault. And, like, they're trying to hit you with that stuff. And you're like, this, like, I'm just not playing this game, dude. This is ridiculous. Like, you need to have your ducks in a row ready for us. We're going to show up. We're going to kick it in the ass. And we're going to be done in a couple of days. Like, whatever you got to do, you got to do. But don't, don't make us look like the assholes here. Because we're yeah. not. And... You know, so then they wanted us to come and bid another job for them. We basically told them, we don't want to bid a job for you because you suck to work for. And they said, well, you guys are the only people that can do the job. You're the only people capable, the only people within a certain radius. Nobody else can do it. So we got to figure something out here. And it's, okay, well, here's the stipulations. And you can either agree to it or not. But if if you don't, then fuck off, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. You know, so that's uh, you have every right as a contractor to refuse work, and don't yeah. let anybody tell you that. Like everybody's like, "Oh, don't burn bridges," blah blah blah. I'm gonna tell you something. There's some bridges worth burning because at the end of the day, the, these guys are trying to play checkers with you, and you got to play chess. Yeah. And because if you don't, you know, you're gonna end up in a very tough situation, just like you talked about, where you're on a snake bit job, and it's just it everything's a nightmare. They're the guy sending you 15 emails a day complaining about every little thing. And nobody wants to deal with that, man. If you do your job and you do it right the first time, you know, you know, I deal with this with concrete guys all the time. And, and, you know, I deal with utility guys about it too. No offense to anybody listening. It's either one. It's nothing personal. It's just, it is what it is. You know, the GCs don't do their job because what they're not doing is they're not checking scopes out. Okay. All they're looking at is the bottom number. Mm -hmm. Okay. They plug it in their little Excel sheet. They submit. They win the job. Woo. Hey. Oh, crap. We have gaps in scope. Concrete guy wants the dirt or asphalt guy. Concrete guy. They want the dirt to be plus or minus an inch. Dirt contracts plus or minus a tenth. You know, well, who's supposed to eat the difference? Yeah. And I know there's tons of contractors out there that have those contracts. Like, there's concrete companies that will not pour concrete unless it's plus or minus an inch. There's dirt. Every dirt contractor will not do work if it's not plus or minus a tenth. I mean, it's just so who's supposed to eat that cost? Yeah, and that's yeah. what we come into is we always say like we'll usually give a price for like ag base or dirt or something, and sometimes we get it, and sometimes they say, well, we've got you know this guy over here, he he wants to do the ag base, or you know, okay, that's fine, no no problem. If your dirt guy wants to do the ag base, no problem, that's cool, we don't care but it better be ready for paving whenever we show up. Mm-hmm. And and that's, we make that very clear from the beginning. So that way the, the dirt guy or the rock guy or something's not going, well, I, I didn't know I was supposed to find grade, you know? And, yeah. and we tell them too, that look, man, cause we run into it a lot too, especially on buildings and stuff. They'll hire somebody who's maybe done dirt and rock work before, but they've never done it for paving. And mm-hmm. so they've done it on a big gravel parking lot. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's cool. You can be, off as long as it drains off and you have water holes whatever but when you're putting paving on it if you've got this type of stuff waving or it's a little low here or a little low here a little high here dude our paving is going to match that and Mm -hmm. guess what that's your fault and if you got soft spots guess what dude that's your fault you don't pass densities and the asphalt fails that's your fault so yeah uh you got to make that stuff very clear before you even start. And I mean, it even gets to a point where you sound like a total ass. I mean, it, you really do as a paving guy. Sometimes you sit here and you sound like a total asshole because you're sitting here laying it all on the line and saying, look, dude, this is exactly what I need. But I'd rather get that out of the way in the beginning. That way 
everybody knows. And then whenever it comes time and our superintendent goes out there and says, dude, this rock looks like shit. Then the rock guy's not going, well, what do you mean? It looks like shit. I think it looks fine. No, this is what it needs to be. And this is where you're off and this is what you need to fix. And you better fix it. Cause we're going to be here tomorrow. And if you don't fix it, we ain't showing up tomorrow. Yep. See, the problem I have is um, I'm on the other side. I'm on the side you're talking about, but mm-hmm. I, I, I haven't done, I can count on one hand on the asphalt parking lots we've done, but um, 99% of the time, you know, we grade it plus or minus a 10th, but it's even, you know, it's not like you're talking about. It's not all wavy and stuff, but, you know, it, it's crazy when you're dealing with concrete contractors because they don't go off contours. Some of them do. The newer, co- the you know, the modern, the companies that are modernizing, they go off GPS too, and they set their forms according to it. Hmm. But you get some of these old boys running string lines still. Why is there a dip here? Well, because there's an inlet right there, and it's got a drain to it. Oh, well, they're not looking well, at the Well, my string line doesn't work to that. Okay, well, yeah, that's not my problem. I I grade the contour. I don't grade to your paving plan, dude. Yeah. So, you know, it, it that that's another thing that they're they still haven't really addressed with um, the plans is, you know, they're, they'll put, you know, okay, this is the contours I need to grade the parking lot to, but the paving plan, if you actually line them up, sometimes they don't line up. Mm -hmm. And, and then you're having to make a field correction out in the field, but who's supposed to eat that? Is it supposed to be the concrete guy's problem? That's supposed to be the dirt guy's problem. You know, or is the utility guy need to change the elevation on, you know, inlets? I mean, it just, it sometimes these plans, they just don't line up and it screws the whole job up. And that's the problem I see a lot too with, especially building plans. Like if an architect made them, mm-hmm. I mean, no hate on architects, but a lot of times architects are not civil engineers and they don't know how to design a parking lot or a roadway, but they do. And they might design the typical section fine like hey we're gonna put in six inch rock and six inch asphalt okay great but a lot of times it's like you're saying that the stuff doesn't line up so the dirt guy builds it per plans and then your paving guy shows up and he's like well this is off and you take your gps or whatever and you show it and you're like dude this is this is by the plans and that's typically whenever you got to go back to you know the gce or the architect or the owner or whoever and say Time for a change order. The dirt's wrong. Cool. We built it right, and we're not fixing it for free. Exactly. You know, and that's usually who it goes ends up going back on is like your dirt guy, or they say we're on a tight deadline. We don't have time. We'll pay for overrun for pavement, and you know, you never know. It's just that's. Oh, I've had it happen. You know, they'll they'll pour. You know, they'll have supposed to be six inch paving. You know, lime cap dirt, and they're like, hey, it ain't gonna work, but. You didn't do anything wrong. You did it according to plan. Everything's blue topped. It matches. Our surveyor checked it. It's good. Hey, we're just going to have to give them more money for concrete. Yep. So some places they got eight inches instead of six. So, you know, it's just, it is what it is at that point, you know, and it sucks. It shouldn't happen. But, you know, there's people that are getting paid a lot of money to make these decisions, but they're so lazy they can't even go by the job site before the job starts and get an accurate topo done. So then I have to go out and verify, and then you have to do the same thing. I have to go out there and verify that the quantities I even bid match what the hell is out there. And 99% of the time it doesn't. Yeah. It's always more. I got to haul more dirt or I got to bring in more dirt. And the owner's like, well, why is this going to cost more now? Well, cause your guy didn't go out there and actually get an accurate topo of the job when he started the job when he built the plans. No, he took the plot plan that was done in 1985. And you know how the Metroplex is. They've been building over here for 20 years, blowing and going. And Mm -hmm. guess what? People dump dirt on empty lots all the time. (laughs) (laughs) We already know this answer. Yeah. You know, and I know up where you're at, it's not as bad, but dude, that's a huge problem down here. Yeah, that's like you have to topo every job. If you don't, you could lose your ass real quick. Dang, that's wild. Yeah, see us, you know, typically, like, for example, I'm working on a personal project right now that I'm wanting to build. And we told the engineer that we're going to hire, hey, uh, this is the lot we want to do it on. This is what we want to do. 
and you know get us an estimate blah 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 for an engineered set of plans for the roadway and, and building pads and all that okay great uh yeah i'm gonna send out two different survey teams you know one for this and one for that and i don't remember what all it was for but you know he's surveying it now and he's you know this is a piece of property that somebody had engineered before and got that information but it was like 10 15 years ago it was a project that ended up not happening on this piece of land but he's still resurveying it and everything so we know it's modern survey but i do see that sometimes too where and actually it's helpful a lot like i see it a lot on state and city projects and stuff municipal projects where there's been a road that's already been built but nobody really kept record of what that road was before well somebody will go back in the archives deep and find you know 1972 plans and they'll be able to say actually here's what's under the road and they'll engineer the job based off those 1970s plans which yeah, well, were but, you know it's probably gonna be more accurate than if they just went you know the the scariest thing about it is this just happened we did a church up in frisco and it's an existing and they're adding on to it and there's a fire lane that goes through the middle of the job well they decided they want to add parking on both sides so we had to cut out the parking mm -hmm. and we had to add dirt and because it's, it's like on a natural hill this it's really pretty property it's got a natural hill on it but they wanted to build out a retaining wall well the retaining wall they weren't going to build yet but they want to get the paving in so they're like hey just push the dirt out and then we'll come back in and we'll we'll dig it out and have the retaining wall guy put it in i said okay no problem so I grade everything according to plan, right? Well, it's been raining a lot here. And last summer, I'm sure you remember, I was telling you about it down here. It was so dry, dude. Oh, yeah, same here. The road by my house, all the concrete's heaved. I mean, they've put asphalt patches everywhere, dude. It looks like a third world country right now. <laughs> over here. And, and, and this is all newer concrete. This ain't old pores these might be five six-year-old roads and they're already you know like this and so while we were working out there we started looking at it and i'm like i'm shooting it right with the gps and i look at the i look at the i look at the road and i'm like we're holding down an extra inch right because we're not doing lime on this one and they go yeah holding down an inch and i'm looking at the side of the concrete where we just cut the curb off and my guys had just took the skid steer and cut out the parking spot mm -hmm. and they'd shot it. It's on grade and I'm looking at it and there's like this much concrete hmm. and it's supposed to tie into that. And I'm like, somebody didn't shoot the fire lane before they made the plans <laughs> and they didn't, they had the existing elevation from when they built it in 2012 mm -hmm. and it dropped that much in 12 years wow that's crazy yeah dude. yeah dude it dropped four inches in 12 wow. years and so i'm like new, they didn't get a new benchmark to go off nope. for it wow they didn't get a new benchmark they didn't get a new they didn't they didn't even check any of that stuff so nothing was lining up so we sent an email to the engineer and the engineer's like hey just feel the correct to accordingly to make it you know line up thank god on the high side where the inlets are uh it works so they didn't have to move the endless because like ours was like a no big change order. i think it was like a couple hundred bucks you know it was just a little bit of work but their stuff would have been they would have had to reroute uh dude, they would have had to raise that inlet like a foot and a half i think was what we figured if they had to it was, it was gonna be bad yeah dude that's crazy man and, and <clears throat> those are the problems you run into it's I don't know it's what keeps the job exciting i guess is those little things because it's stressful and you're like what the hell but those are the issues that i don't know somebody's got to solve them i guess and it, it you know you can say that an engineer's dumb or you can say that they're lazy or whatever i i do think that engineers could stand to drive the jobs more um a lot of engineers i know don't and that's that's really a shame i mean i know that one golly he's he's got to be in his mid 60s dude's a g every set of plans he's ever written he'll literally do it on just a regular eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and he'll just tell you what he wants he leaves wiggle room for the contractor to kind of do minor field engineering and he basically says this is what i want the end product to be figure it out and the, but he's driven the job he knows that job like the back of his hand 
and you can hit him up and say, Hey dude, like you didn't give me any grades here. You didn't do that. And he'll come out, dude, he will come out and he will personally shoot it and survey it. And I mean, awesome guy. And he'll work with you one-on-one and it's, it's incredible. He'll sit down, he'll have a meeting with everybody and he'll tell you exactly what he wants and what it needs to be and say, all right, I fucked up here on the design, write a change order for it. Let's go. That guy's awesome. But then there's ones that you run into a big problem and it's because the engineers never even seen the job. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is a pretty obvious thing. If you would have just come out here, you know, driven an hour to the job to look at it. And it's just, uh, it's the just problem weird. that you have is the ones that are too prideful to admit they made a mistake. And this is what happened to us on a job. And that's most of them. Yeah. Like last year there was a grade bust out there and, um, uh, it was like 4,000 yards that we had excess material to haul off. The job was supposed to be balanced, which that never happens hardly anymore. Hmm. But the guy supposedly made it so it's balanced. So we go out and topo it. First we thing we did was we shot it by hand. Then we stripped it. Then we took the strippings out and uh, piled them up. Then we flew the drone on it. So we did both. And both are showing roughly 3,800 to 4,000 trucking yards. Of course, we swelled it for trucking, but mm-hmm. yeah, you know, for for haul off. And so I send the RFI to um, the GC, and I say, "Hey, uh, what do you want to do with this extra material? Is there a spot on the location that you guys aren't going to use? Because there was a ton of green areas on the job." And I said, "Hey, if you just raise all the green area, like." four inches you know you can burn all this dirt and uh they said well let's call the engineer and we'll get this rfi pushed up and get find out what we should do engineers like there's no way he's wrong he don't know what he's talking about blah 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 there's going to be no haul off at the end of that job so uh when the concrete was going down with the four thousand yard stockpile that was still sitting there um they finally called me and said, uh, give us a price to haul it off. And so now I got to haul it on concrete and I got to bring an excavator in there in a tight ass parking lot. So you can imagine that change order doubled from what it would have been if I'd been out there the first time to do it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. He ended up getting fired off the job, but I mean, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Like I sat across from the guy two or three times he he kept telling me I don't know what I'm talking about, and so I never told anyone this. You know what I'm doing, but uh, I'm actually going to school for that now oh, because really? I'm being tired of being told I don't know what I'm talking about. So what I'm going to be able to do now is go. That's great. I went through the same training you did and same apprenticeship you did, and I also have 20 years of field experience. And you're a fucking moron. <laughs> and I can say it straight to their fucking face and be serious. Well, you know, that's one of those you know, things too, man. And it's not that you got to be like that, but, you know, and, you know, like you said, there's awesome engineers. You know, there's a couple of them we deal with all the time that we do a ton of work with those guys. You build a rapport with them, especially the geotechs. We deal with, you know, you and I, both both of us deal with the geotechs all the time. Oh, yeah. And you get a good rapport with those guys, man. You know, oh, yeah. you don't have a lot of problems. Right. Yeah, dude. And that's one of those things that even going back to our very beginning deal about, you know, politics, man, that's what this industry is. I mean, people that if all you do is operate, you're not, you you don't deal with too many politics, right? But if you're on our level, you deal with a lot of politics and that doesn't just mean with politicians. That means the people that are creating these jobs, the people that are paying you, the people that have the power to create more jobs and dude you get people that have those those thick egos and you know you sit there and you try to tell them things won't work and they oh well yeah man you've got to learn how to talk to those guys and make them think it's their idea and that's Mm -hmm. politics dude you you know there's so many arrogant people out there and you have to be able excuse me go to them and say hey man um you know, I saw this, blah, blah, blah. You know, what's your thought process going on there? I don't know that this is going to work too well. Uh, and then you've got to make, you already have the answer in your head. You already know what's going to happen. You already know what needs to happen. But you have to make that guy think about it. 
and you have to make him come back and say, guys, I noticed an issue with these plans and this inlet's the wrong grade and it's not going to drain water. I saw it. And you have to let him stroke his ego and make him think it's his idea. And, you know, there's guys like that, you know, and then there's guys that you can be cool with and just straight up, hey, dude, this ain't going to work. I'm sorry, we can't build this. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, what, what do we need to do? Here's what we need to do. And you get that as you work with people, like our city government, for example. Like I said, you know, we're the main contractor that does work, that kind of work, you know, paving work and stuff in town. And they come to us and they say, what do we need to do to fix this problem? How do we need to design this job? They still have to put it out for bid. They still, I mean, we're not giving these guys any money. They still put it out for bid. They still do it. But we have that close working relationship with them over years of rapport and years of working with them. And then, you know, sometimes you go to your politicians or you go to your city people and you say, dude, there ain't enough work in this area to keep us afloat. Oh, well, you know, we do need to do some jobs. We've got some money set aside. Let's, let's do something. You know, it's, that's what our job is as man, you know, project managers, construction managers, whatever you want to call us is to make sure everybody's on the same page and everybody's profitable. And sometimes that's dealing with those assholes and it's frustrating as hell to make them want to stroke their ego and make them think they have it, you know, that it's their idea when it's your idea. I struggled this with a lot early on in my career of, people wanting it to be, you know, their idea, but me being like, especially whenever I was like 20 years old, being like, oh, I want credit for coming up with that. That was my idea, but you never get credit for it. But those people, now the job's getting done the right way. And you move on. You're like, all right, great. We're all happy. The job's done the right way. I don't even care if anybody noticed that that was me who did that. Yeah. At the end of the day, my only goal is uh, get in, get out, get paid. And yeah. whatever I got to do in between to make those three things happen, I'm going to do. You know, I, I like this new client we're working for. Um, we've done a couple of projects for him now. That new client. Yeah, new client. So the superintendent, that they, they're very big on, they have two superintendents. They'll have an assistant and they have a regular, like a lot of the bigger GCs do. But what's great is they have really old guys apprenticing really young guys. So they got the guys that have been doing it 40 years, teaching the guy might have just got out of the trades or out of college. It's awesome. You know maybe been out of school or the trades for a year or two. So they're really learning how to run an entire job versus this is their specialized field. And now you're going to learn the whole spectrum of the business. And we were on a job la uh, with the, one of the superintendents, um, great guy. Um, um, he knows who he is. He listens to the show and uh, I'll get, he didn't want to be shouted out. So I'm not going to do it, but um he's uh he's old school he, he reminds me of the guys like when i came in the business um the the gc when i first started in dirt work um a lot of the times the general contractor self-performed something mm -hmm. whether it was the concrete they did the framing themselves one of the guys on the crew was an electrician one of the guys might have been a plumber like they did something on the job themselves yeah and they usually had a machine on the site they always had a container that had their own tools. So if you needed help with something, they could help you. Um, they always had ladders, you know, and it's shifted so much from that environment to they're just office managers pretty much. Yeah. Yes. And so what's great was I got a taste of it with him. Like we're out demoing concrete last week. He's signing tickets for us. He's signing the trucking tickets and he's got the flag flagging the trucks. I mean, this guy's 60 something years old. He's out there. And I'm like, Hey, we got it, man. He's like, no, no, I'll, I'm, I'm going to sit in my truck and be bored all day. Let me help you guys. I love being out here with you guys. And the project manager, they got phenomenal. They, they, um, uh, been a PM for 20 years, you know, knows she knows who she is. She is awesome too. First time in a really long time. I can say that about a GC. I mean, I, I and I'm sad to say it like that, but, dude phenomenal group and uh i do 100 projects with them they, mm -hmm. they have been absolutely fantastic to work with and they're real yeah. you know and you know they didn't argue anything about contract corrections they added stuff that um they're like well you know if this situation comes up let's do this for you so we'll put some money in here for this it, you know it they worked with me mm -hmm. it was a true trade partner 
deal. Yeah. And I haven't had that in years. And it was like, where the hell have you guys been all my life, man? Like I've been <laughs> dealing with all these scumbags and shit for yeah. years. You there's, know? Two, there's two good kinds of contractors I've learned. There's the ones like that that work with you and you have issues, you know, they're partners, they check in on you. And then there's the ones that are like, yo, we'll be ready this date. If anything changes, we'll let you know, show up. We don't need to tell you how to do it. We know that you're good. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and those are the ones. That's the like. two I like to work for. And, I've, and out of the five people I do a lot of work for, four of the five are like that. And, you know, one's kind of micromanaging, but I can deal with them. But Yeah, a little bit of micromanaging. That's not bad. And I don't mind it if it means that if they're communicating – I don't mind it. It's a little micromanaging. Just hey, where are you going to be here? What's your schedule looking like? What's it? You know, yeah. And you're just like, oh, dude. Sometimes you're like, leave me alone. But also, you're like, I'd take this over nothing. Or yeah, I'd take and then an ass. The crazy thing is, is um, same company. The project manager that's running the other job, he, we haven't even done a job with this guy yet, and uh, I don't know him from Adam. And he calls me up and he says, hey, uh, I got your contract corrections. And they asked us to build them a lay down yard. No mm -hmm. problem. So we gave him a price to do it. Um, so I said to him, he says to me, he says, hey, I noticed on your proposal you don't have machine backfill. I said, well, yeah, we got in away from it. He says, well, why would you do that? I says, because you can't make any money with it. I says, I'll be honest with you, man. It, it's a waste of a mob. It's a waste of everyone's time. I says, you should just have your concrete guy do it while he's out there. As soon as he's wrecking forms, take some rakes and a skid steer because he's going to have one out there and move the dirt. I'll pile it up in the islands for you, and I'll make it so he can still set his forms. Mm -hmm. And all he's got to do is just spread it out. And he goes, well, I really want you to do it. And I'm like, but I don't want to do it. And he's like, okay, well, can you do it for free? So then he, you know, he asked me to do it. And then I'm like, okay, I'm thinking about it. And then it was, can you do it for free? Oh, shit. And I get it, you know, because we had a really good rapport the last two jobs we did with them. And they worked with us a lot on contract language and stuff. And I, that was in the back of my mind. It really was. Yeah. But when you ask that part, you know, I might have done it discounted. I might have done it at cost, you know. But then he asked for free. Mm -hmm. And I went, I'll make you a deal. He said, what's that? I said, I get 25% up front. I'll backfill your curbs. I'll get the concrete guy to do it. Okay. That's what I thought. And it wasn't to be, it's not to be rude, and it's not to be a jerk. It's just, you know, I don't mind doing it, but, uh, you know, this isn't a small job. This right. ain't a wa Whataburger or, you know, in and out or, you know, something small where it's five curbs five islands you got to backfill it takes you half a day and you're done yeah, yeah cool i'll do that no problem no dude this thing's like on 10 acres it's all parking hmm. yeah you got a couple thousand yards of backfill it's like no <laughs> i'm doing it for free yeah you know yeah yeah i mean you can't do anything for free i mean that's i just had that talk um with a guy here recently you know he's like oh yeah dude i've always been a good old boy i'll do all sorts of shit for free and uh you know he's like i've always been like that but now i'm learning i can't do that because i'll literally lose money and you know he's got a guy working for him now that is all about dude change orders quit doing shit for free quit being a good old boy this is not how it works <laughs> and you know he's learning that and it, it's tough you know but a lot of people want to do stuff for free and when you when you literally have a job bid I don't know, say a job's bid for 10 million bucks to build a building or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've learned this because I've got friends on the other side and they flat out told me, they're like, dude, we probably got close to 800,000 to a million bucks. So that money is contingency funds. Oh yeah. And I says, really? It's that high. He goes, yeah, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30% of the whole job is contingency funds. Yeah. And I said to him, so why do you guys fight so hard to, to, you know, not approve change orders? And he said, well, it depends on the structure of the contract. And so he was telling me about, you know, cost plus versus this versus that. He was teaching me all the different stuff that they do on their end. And I said to him, I says, because I noticed certain jobs, if you got a change order, 
it's like no problem you get it and you could be working for the same person and you go do another job for them and they're like well you gotta talk to the owner yeah what do you mean you gotta talk to the owner you just my last job i was on well you no problem they're like well this contract's different Mm -hmm. and it's i guess it's all based on the contract because like some of them man it's like yeah you you send them all day they'll sign them well i think it depends on the owner too i think and again, I know that we, you guys work more for GCs. We work more for governments. So yeah. like, on a, like on a state job, you know, they will allow a little bit. They're not necessarily putting contingency in there. Why is it doing the thumbs down again? Thumbs up. Uh, you know, on a, on a state job or something, there's no real contingency. Now they might put a little bit of fluff in the numbers. They might say, all right, we think it's going to be 8,000 tons of asphalt. Well, they might actually put, you know, 8,500 tons of asphalt on there or something like that in case you overrun or in case there's this or that or the other, you know, Hey, we're going to go ahead and put a line item for patching in there. You know, we're going to put a few cubic yards of concrete in there just in case we need to do something, fix these curbs or, you know, a foot or two a curb at a time. You know, there's little things like that that they'll put in there. Um, But overall, everything's got to be a change order. And, you know, if, if they've got that contingency, it's very minute. And so you go to them for everything and you say, this is a change order. Now it's different because it's public money. And so you say, well, I need to make a change order for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. This was calced wrong. It needs to be re-engineered. And then we got to do it. It's going to be a big change order, a hundred thousand dollars. Then they go and then it's got to run up to now the flagpole, all that. But then ultimately again, it's public funds. And they say, all right, yeah, granted, let's do it. We got it to they make the job run. But whenever you're building a somebody's office, you know, I think it depends on the job because some owners say, I want every change order to come through me. I don't want contingency. I want to tell you if it's necessary or not, if we want to pay for it or not. So we've ran into that before where we're building a parking lot and you hit soft spots and you tell them, hey, this is really soft. We need to patch it. Otherwise, we're going to put this new asphalt down. And it's going to fall apart as soon as we leave here. And they say, I don't want to pay for patching. And you say, you really have to. You can't not. And they're like, nope, just pave it over whatever. But then you get some where you're like, hey, we need to do patching. And it's uh, just, yeah, you're good. Patch it. Here's verbal confirmation. You know, here's an email. We're going to send you an actual change order here pretty soon. And it's like, yeah. okay, that's different. You know, so it, I think it really depends on your owner because some owners really want to have a say in it and skin the game. And some owners tell the GC, dude, don't even talk to me about this building until you are ready to hand me the keys. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, um, I noticed that because I'm, you know, I'm doing a lot of, I do a lot of ISD work. And I do do city work. So kind of similar circumstance to what you're dealing with. ISDs are horrible to deal with about change orders. What about ISD? School districts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, I forget. Down here we call them ISDs. Independent school district. Dude, OSU got lucky every... I, I'm an OSU fan. Don't get me wrong. Which I, I don't really care that much about football or whatever. But like, I mean, OSU is my team. And I went to school there. And... I was like, dude, we suck. We're not good. We got lucky on all these games. Then I was like, how did we get to the Big 12 championship, dude? We were playing Texas. <laughs> but, but the problem is, is the rest of the Big 12 was ass too. So, Dude, the only good teams last year was like, in the Big 12, it was Kansas State, y'all, us, and Oklahoma. Everybody else was horrible last year. And, and they I, brought three new schools in last year. Yeah. <laughs> Well, OU wasn't that good either. I mean, well, I mean, they still had a, I think they still had a 10, 10 games record. I think they won 10 games last year. Uh, I couldn't remember. I knew they lost. They Normally they only oh. lose one or two games and this year they lost like three or four. I don't remember. But and the status part is dude, if Texas would have had, I don't know, maybe two or three more minutes in the Red Bull or Red River, I think they would have won. I mean, they were, they kind of stalled out in the third quarter and Oklahoma came back and I'm like, man, they're going to, they're going to turn it on here in the fourth. And they started, but they was just down too much. And I yeah. don't know. It's a shame that OSU doesn't get to play Texas anymore. Cause that was always a fun game. I mean, obviously it wasn't as big as the red river rivalry, but I'm glad that it was that a close game. one. Yeah. I'm glad that the, the red river rivalry will live on, but I am a little sad that OSU doesn't play Texas anymore. I really don't think Texas and Oklahoma are going to stay in the SEC very long. We'll I see. really don't. Yeah. I think they're going to go over there, and Dion's going to come to the Big 12 with CU, and I think that's going to – I think the Big 12 is going to start getting a lot of limelight, and 
I think everybody's tired of the SEC because I know I'm one of them. I didn't want Texas. I, I told you this. I'm one of the guys that didn't want Texas to go to the SEC. I said, what do we got to prove over there? We beat yeah. Alabama. We beat Georgia. What, what 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 do we got to prove? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. It's going to be interesting. I mean, I hope it makes it better. College football is so it's biased. It's so not fun to watch anymore. Like it, the the reason it was fun was cuz it was about it was about guys that actually wanted to play the sport, right? And now yeah. it's dude, it and that's this is why I don't like they're and getting I paid I, now. I I don't mind people getting paid. I really don't. Like I'm not one of those guys that's like, "Oh, well fuck the NFL. They make too much money." No, I don't care about that, but it's like college was fun because it was pure. I mean, it was like mm-hmm. I'm playing the sport because I love it or I'm playing the sport because it I want to go pro. Like there was there was skin in the game, you know, now and, and there's skin in the game now, but it's I mean, you can get a 17 or 18 year old on a seven figure salary making more than the coach. And if he gets pissed off and doesn't he doesn't like it, then he can transfer mid season to another team and you're like Dude, this is crazy. Like, well, I think they're, I think they're going to, they realized they, uh, they started a monster that they can't control now. And I think the NCAA is like really going, okay, we got, we got to do something about this because they're already talking about changing the NIL rules. And I know they're going to start talking about transfer portal yeah. because it used to be, and you remember this, I think you and me went to college around the same time frame. Well, I would have went to college when you did, but I was, was in the army, but, Back when I would have went, if I had played college football and I was at, say, let's say I was at, um, you know, Texas State and I wanted, and I got an opportunity to go play D1 with Texas, it's like, cool, you're going to transfer to Texas and you are going to sit a year. And that's that incentivized guys not to leave because right. it's like, okay, cool. So you're going to go over there. You could be the best player on the team. You're going to sit because mm-hmm. that's the rules. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't happen that much back then. Yeah, you still had guys transfer, but it wasn't rampant like it. I mean, you look at like after Saban retired, three quarters of Alabama transferred. Yeah. And I, I get that just because it's a leadership thing. But, you know, dude, what are we teaching our kids whenever we do that? Like, what are we teaching your in 18 years? I'll stick it out during the hard times. Yeah. You, you're teaching them that, hey, dude, um, you don't like it? Fucking leave. Yeah. Fucking quit. And, and, and that's the hard part, man, is, there's a fine line there between being loyal and leaving because you're truly unhappy. And and this is great tie back into workforce. Like, okay, dude, I think that whenever you're young, you should try a lot of jobs. And I think that you should work for a guy, your size. I think that you should work for a company, the size that I work for, which is a little bit bigger than you. And then I think that you should go work for a big, big company. Or I think that you should try electrical. I think you should try plumbing. I think you should try dirt. I think you should try paving. I think you should try a lot of things to see what you like. And maybe you try one or two things. And and that's what I did. I I worked, you know, for dirt. I worked for a building guy. I worked for uh, materials testing. I worked for a landscaper. And then I worked in asphalt and asphalt. And I worked for those other ones a very small amount of time. And then I worked in asphalt. And I was like, yeah, I love this. This is where I want to be. And I made that decision whenever I was 19 years old. You know, but you got to move around a little bit to figure out what you want to do, whether that be a company, it could be in the same industry. All right. You know, it could be, let's say somebody works for you right now and they're not super happy and they want to go find somewhere else. Well, they want to find another dirt moving company. They don't necessarily want to totally change industries or change trades, but is it this company's ass and just, just terrible to work for. They treat me like shit and I hate it. Or is it, You know, just, hey, we're going through some hard stuff right now as a company, and if I stick it out, I know I'll be good. And where's that line of this place sucks, and, man, I just need, you know, the rose-colored glasses are off. I just just need to stick it out a little bit, and it'll be worth it. And there's a fine line there between loyalty and leaving. And it's case by case. But whenever you, you tell kids that, hey, Oh, you're not starting quarterback anymore? Oh, well, that's horrible. You should be the starting quarterback. And they say, well, fuck it. I'm going to transfer from this school to that school, and I'll be starting quarterback there. Well, that's the path of least resistance. There's no competition now of, all right, dude, I I get it. I got beat out. The coach thinks that he's better. I'm going to prove him wrong. 
and I'm going to show up. I'm going to be the first one in the weight room. I'm going to do it. Same as at work, dude. Oh, that guy's the foreman? They promoted him to foreman instead of me? That's bullshit, dude. I've been slaving away out here, and I'm going to prove them wrong. I don't know what they saw in that guy, but I'm going to make sure they know they picked the wrong guy. And you work, and you try to beat them out, right? Or maybe it is really that you just are miserable there, and you go work for somewhere else, and you flourish there. I don't know. But that... That matters, dude. It takes away a certain aspect of hard work of I'm going to prove myself versus I got other options. I'll just go to one of them and it's where I don't have to work so hard. Yeah, I had that. I had that same problem when um with guys over the years and I did. The, I mean, I'll attest to it. I got out of the army and that was the most consistent job I'd had at the time. I did eight years. And I probably went between probably the time I got out. I got out in 13 till I started working for myself, which was in 17. No. Yeah, 17. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, 19. So that was six years. I probably had six jobs. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I got out. I was 25 years old. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do when I got out. At first, I thought I wanted to be a cop. And that was about the time all the stuff was going on with everything. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not a politics guy. I don't talk about that stuff on my show. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was like, I'm going to end up on TV, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. So I'm not going that route. So I went on, I went in the oil field, and I really enjoyed it. The money was great, and I was young, and it was like, man, I'm going to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And then I went in the pipeline. I loved it. And then, you know, you get laid off a lot with that, so you're always having to go somewhere else. And I finally got laid off for the last time, and I went, there's no pipeline starting for, like, three or four months. I was like, all right, I'm going to go home and try my hand in construction. So I came home and started working for an excavation company, and – I worked there a couple of years, and before I knew it, I was a foreman. And then I, I got an opportunity to go be a superintendent somewhere. So I took it. And funny thing was, I ended up going back to the company I was at before to be a motor grader operator because I was taking a substantial pay cut. But the culture was better. I had a good rapport with everybody there. The way they did the work made sense to me. The way the other guys did it, it just, I don't know how they made any money, but that's their business and so when i built my company i modeled it after that company and it was like this is how i want to be and so i can attest to that myself that when you're young you should do that but once you find the place that you like that's when you do you know okay anybody can go down the street and get two more dollars an hour or get ten thousand more dollars a year salary somebody's gonna especially right now in this job market now the work is starting to slow down the economy is not slowing down but it's starting to kind of instead of go vertical it's starting to kind of go more horizontal so they're not building as much so companies aren't as eager to hire as they were so they're not going to throw these lucrative bonuses out and huge pay raises and stuff and so a lot of guys i talk to now they're like man I, I was getting this at this place, but nobody will even offer me that now. And I'm like, nobody needs anybody really that bad right now. Like, you know, and the other thing too is, uh, you know, we listen to, we both listen to a lot of podcasts and watch a lot of stuff on LinkedIn and stuff. You're very, you're very big on LinkedIn. I'm always on there. I don't post much, but I always see what people post. And for years, people are like, you should ask for more money. You should do this. You should do that. And it's like, yeah, you should. Absolutely. But you should do it by your actions. It should be your work ethic. It should be, you know, what have you helped the company do? You know, have you helped the company grow? Are you a team player? You know, these such things should be addressed too. It shouldn't just be, well, I know what I'm worth. Well, I don't think you're worth that. Dude, you see a lot a comparison of to football. I've seen a lot of guys come in and, and, you tell them, hey, this is what we'll start you at. And 
you see a few guys and it's usually guys that have some good experience under their belt. And I would say most guys, you tell them what it's going to be. And, and like where I'm at, we pay pretty well and starting out, especially for a home every night job in our town, our demographic, it, it's, it's really a, a really good paying job compared to most. And it's, there's still guys that come in. They've been working on the road They've been working in the oil field. They've been traveling. They've been working for these other companies and they got laid off or whatever. And now they're trying to come in and they're trying to negotiate for 10 more dollars an hour than what you're offering to pay them. And I'm sorry, but the job market around here does not support that. Like we, we cannot afford to pay you that. Uh, and you know, if you do want that, you've got to come in and you've got to start maybe a little bit lower We'll still take care of you. We'll still, you know, treat you right. But you got to come in a little bit lower and you've got to prove that you're worth that. I mean, and you even get guys that they're not that experienced. Like, you know, maybe they worked for a farmer or something and they know basic equipment operating. Um, I mean, because you know as well as I do. I mean, I know guys that have worked in the agriculture industry for a long time, most of their lives, and then they try to come to construction. And they know the basics of equipment operating, but running a tractor with GPS or a combine with GPS is a lot different than getting dirt on grade. I mean, they, they, they have their own unique set. I mean, I can't go run a combine and, and harvest wheat all day. I sure I could learn, but I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to go in there. I mean, I, I have buddies that, that that's what they do, man. And they are really good at it and they are really fast at it and they're really efficient at it and they make money at it, a lot of money at it. But you know, they don't know anything about laying asphalt <laughs> and, and those guys make good hands eventually, but they come in and they say, well, I want to make this much money. And you're like, well, sorry, I can't pay you that. But you know, you can't even ask for that until you come in and you say, let's say they want 28 bucks an hour. And you're like, dude, our job market does not support $28 an hour here and rural Oklahoma. You know, we could start you at throw a number out there, 21 bucks an hour. Well, man, I can't work for that. Well, you can't work for that or you just think that you're worth more than you actually are. Do you actually think you're worth that much? All right, let's give you 60 days. We'll pay you that much and and we'll see if you're worth that much. And you know, a lot of times whenever you lay it on the line that much and you say, we'll evaluate you and you will see. And a lot of times they go, you know what? You're right. I'll take less because they know that they're not worth that. And, and that's where I don't like that whole culture of, you know, they say, know your worth you know, know your worth and ask for more money and this and that. Know your worth does not mean that you're worth a lot. Know your worth means be real with yourself. Like if you're working somewhere for $15 an hour and you know that you are better than that, work your ass up, dude. Like if you're flagging traffic and whatever, and you're only making that much, like work your way up, figure out how can I do some more stuff? Talk to your boss. Hey, how can I advance? How can I make more money? Do this stuff. Don't just go in there and say, I want to make more money. Say, how can I make more money? Now, if you're a top guy and I just talked to a guy that went through this, he was basically running this company and he went to him and he said, Hey, I know how much money I'm bringing in and I know how much you're paying me and the dollars ain't matching up. Like, you know, this is what other people in my same position, other companies are making. I really would appreciate if I could get a raise and he's worth the raise. And they basically said, we can't afford to do that. And he goes, why? Well, I'm sorry. I can't afford to keep working here. He left on good terms. He's still cool with those guys, but he went to another company that was like, yeah, dude, this is what, you know, we'll, we'll pay you that extra bit. Like, that's fine. That's, that's the going rate. Like, so he knew his worth and he didn't stick around in a shithole job because he knew his worth and he knew he needed more, but you know, he couldn't go to that next person and, and charge an absurd amount of money. No, no, it, it's, it is different. I've been on both ends. You have too, James, um, being on salary side, being on the hourly side of it. Yeah. Um, it's a different conversation. Um, you know, I feel like in the field, it was easier to get a raise. Like they put you on a motor grader. Um, you know, you start finishing, you start doing more tasks that they're asking you to do. You start running jobs for them, being lead operator or whatever. Yeah, that was an easy raise, you know, because mm -hmm. all he had to do was put on the form. He's doing this, this, and this now above this pay scale. Yeah, HR changes your pay scale. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he, he, he's no longer a laborer. He's an yeah. equipment operator. Yeah. yeah. And so 
you know, when I moved into the office and did PM time and went from being a superintendent and PM was a little bump and I remember I walked in there and I started running like, I don't know, two or three jobs. And then before I know it, I had like 10 and they kept giving me all the complicated stuff because I had field experience, whereas the other PMs didn't. Mm -hmm. So they would come to me with their problems and ask me to help them fix it. And it's like, Hey man, uh, how do you, how do you like justify rework? Like you don't justify rework. Like, what do you mean? Like you don't ever rework for free. They're like, you serious? I'm like, no. Do you got know that? Like, really? Like, you're a project. Why am I telling you this? Like, it was shocking how these guys are supposed to be the guy that I'm supposed to call when I was out in the field. And if I had a question, they were supposed to have the answer for me. And it's like, that's scary. So <laughs> I started, you know, training these guys on how to be better project managers. And I started telling them, like, how many times a week do you guys go to, go to your own jobs? None of them did. And I, I was like, uh, okay, um, you should probably drop by the job. Like you have a company truck and a company fuel card. Why, why aren't you going by the jobs? Oh, well, you know, I got so much here to do at the office. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? You, you check heavy job every morning and make sure the quantities are up to date so you can submit them. I'm like, um, you check time cards. Um, you verify invoices. What else you got? Oh, well, you know, I got to go over this contract. Like, uh-huh. So we have contract administrators. So what are you doing with the contract? And I, it was just trying to, like you were talking about earlier with working in a bigger company. I went to PM at a big company. So we had departments for everything. So we had people that just dealt with contracts. That's all they did all day. They, they did our contracts. Mm -hmm. So when I hear guys saying all this, I'm like, you guys are making all this money. And I got guys I know for a fact are out there killing themselves for this company and they're paying them crap. Mm -hmm. And so I went in my, the office for my boss and he was the vice president of our division. And I sat down with him and I said, Hey, um, I'd like to become the senior PM. And he said, okay. He says, what's your qualifications? So I just listed everything that you and I just talked about. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I'm doing their jobs for them. He goes, okay. I said, I don't want the raise though. And he just kind of looks at me. He goes, what do you mean you don't want the raise? I said, I want to earn the raise. He said, okay. I said, give me 90 days. I'll go take care of all this. If I've done that after 90 days, then we'll sit down and you tell me if I earn the raise or not. So after 90 days, we sit down. He's like, yeah, you've earned it. They gave me the raise. And, uh, but that's an example of, to me, if you're in administrative side of the job, you're in project management, you're in operations of the company. If you want the money, I think you need to show me that you can do the job and I'll be more than happy to do, let you do it, you know? And if you've earned it, I will give you that raise and I'll put it in writing. You know, I'll be like, this is contingent on after 90 days of review, you know, We'll talk about it. If the pros and cons, the pros are outweighing the cons, let's do it. But if not, no. Well, and that's what people want, dude. They want a plan. I mean, people my age, I always say kids, you know, I mean, I'm a kid, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm 25 years old. I'm, I'm a kid, yeah. but, but thankfully, uh, due to some of my life choices and, and good parenting and stuff like that, um, I'm a lot further along than most people my age. And, I've learned a lot of hard lessons in my short time on this earth so far. And so whenever I say kids, you know, I use that as a broad term, really anybody 18 to 30 uh, or sometimes even older, all they want is a plan, dude. You know, all they want is to use you to say whether they know it or not. All right. A lot of people are not taught how to set goals. They're not taught to set goals. They're not taught to make goals. But if you look at a guy and you say, look, man, what is your what what is making it for you? What do you want? What is your goal? And you get an eighteen year old kid says, "I want to be an excavator operator and I want to be making twenty five dollars an hour." Well, you got to sit there and you get to say, "All right, man. Well, we're going to start you at sixteen dollars an hour as a flagger, and here's what you've got to do to get there. And here's how long 
it could take you if you really bust your ass. And here's how long it could take you if you don't bust your ass. And you may never make it if you don't bust your ass. But now you're putting the ball in his court. And you're saying, look, if you want to do it, I will, I will hold up my end of the bargain. But you have to put in the work to develop yourself. Oh, and you want to be a foreman maybe one day? All right. But you've got to learn how to be a leader. And you've got to learn how money works. And you've got to learn how to delegate work. And here's how to do that. And I will work with you. And you better ask questions. But the ball's in your court to do this. I'll hold up my end if you hold up your end. I'll meet you halfway. And that's what people want. Most people don't even know that that's an option. I mean, a lot of times people are taught by their parents, oh, man, you know, they get some lazy-ass parents. And, you know, I've worked with these types of guys before, and they never last at a job. They usually end up quitting after a few months or maybe even a couple of years. But, you know, their total energy sucks. And, man, I've been working for this fucking place for 10 god dang years and they don't give a shit about me and if i quit tomorrow i don't think they'd give a fuck it's like yeah dude they probably actually wouldn't you know they probably don't actually care about you because you are not a good dude you're not that great of an employee the only thing good about you is that you show up every day they can rely on you to show up when you're here you're an energy suck and you're not very fun to be around and maybe you just did work for a bad company that doesn't give a shit about you and that's on you if you stuck around that long but that's what a lot of kids are taught is that if you bust your ass because they're having somebody tell them, Oh, I bust my ass every day. And, and this, you know, this is the best I can do for us. And it's really just bad parenting being taught that, you know, Oh, all this quote unquote hard work and you get no reward. Well, a lot of those people are people that have been in the same position for many years and they've never ever promoted gotten much raises or anything like that because that's all they're worth and that's they've they've capped out and they can't go any higher because they're just incapable of it yeah i always used to tell my guys when i got a new guy especially a labor young kid coming on i used to sit him down and i go okay what are your what are your short-term goals and they just kind of look at me and they go short term I'm like well what do you want to do are you wanting to go to college? Is this just going to be a job you do while you're going to college? You know, some kids do that. You know, they come work construction, go to school. You know, they work during the day and go to school at night. I, I actually did it. You know, I thought I wasn't going to be in construction anymore. You know, after I got my cybersecurity degree, you know, no, I'm right here with in the trenches with everybody else. But, you know, a lot of them, it's like, hey, man, I want to learn how to run this machine. Like you said, James, you know, I, I want to learn to, you know, blue top i want to you know i want to learn how to finish on a bulldozer and it's like okay what's your long-term goal and half of them never had one right and i said to them do you know what your long-term goal should be i said what's that i said it should be your name on the fucking door and they looked at me and they go what i said own your own business that should be your long-term goal mm -hmm. be your own boss i said because punching in the clock for the man yeah it's cool i did it i did it for 10 years it's a good it's a good life honestly i could turn my phone off and at five o'clock and turn it back on at six in the morning and in between i didn't care yeah what my problem it was the company's problem right when you become an owner it's 24 7 job and you got to have a you got to have a different mindset for that but the caveat to that is there's entrepreneurs out there and there's not you're an entrepreneur you know you you have your stuff that you do and you know Every person I talk to, they have a different opinion about it. But I tell every one of them, your long-term goal should be either A, to be the guy running the company, owning the company, or being a shot caller in the company. You should be one of those three. That should be your long-term goal. It shouldn't be, oh, I want to become a superintendent. That's a great goal. That is a great goal to get to. You should get above that. Yeah. Because when you're 55 years old, you're not going to want to get up at 530 in the morning and go get in your truck and drive to a job site like you've been doing for the last 35 years. Now, there's some guys out there that want to do that. Tip my hat to them. Yeah. I didn't want to do that. And yeah. I'm doing it now. Um, you know, I've shrunk the company down. And I'll tell you, I'm enjoying it. But I know, I know, I already know because of experience, I don't want to do this in 10 years when I have kids. Right. And I want to take them to school and I want to pick them up from school and I want to go to soccer practice and I want to go to football practice and I want to go to Boy Scout trips and, you know, I want to take them shooting and I want to go hunting with them and fishing. 
you can't do that if you're sitting on the job site Mm -hmm. you know and and so well dude and nothing's better than just being financially free i mean honestly whether like okay i work for a company like yeah i'm one of the top guys there uh that's cool um and like you said i have my side ventures you know i'm making money from other incomes and stuff so it's like if there's ever a time where it's like yo i'm out of pto but i still want to take this trip i'm gonna take that trip you know what i mean like it's like okay i can afford to miss a day or two of work without getting paid and still go on this trip and do the stuff like it's a cool feeling because you know you've put money in the right place you know so it's like and i've started telling new hires this man you guys are making good money you're making a livable wage you're not getting rich but you're making a good livable wage in this industry better than you can anywhere else right now better than you can literally like i tell guy like i told a new hire kid this the other day 19 years old i said this is i said you have zero experience am i right and he's like yeah but you have no experience i mean you you've done some construction stuff before but I mean, in my eyes, you have zero experience. You have zero road work experience. You have a little bit of work experience, but I said, overall, you have no experience. What got you this job is you walked in here, clean cut. You were early for your interview. You're very respectful. That's why you got this job, okay? This is the best paying job in town that you're going to get right now because you don't have any experience. You have no qualifications or credentials, you're making decent money here. You can live off this and you can afford to put money back. Don't go bury yourself in debt. All right. Don't go buy a new truck. Don't go buy a house you can't afford. Don't go do th- stupid things with your money. Don't buy all these toys and all that. Like, so let's start saving, putting some money back. And I'm here for you if you want to learn how to do that. And you can live a good life with what you're making now and with what you have the potential to make if you hold up your end of the deal. And I mean, just saying that, man, that's a, that's a good feeling for people, for your employees yeah. and them to know that, Hey, first of all, you care. And there was another girl in there that had worked for us before. And I kind of knew a little bit about her situation. I said, I don't know exactly what your situation is, but if you want to get out of debt, come talk to me. Like there's nothing better you can do than to have that feeling as a long-term goal to where you you know all right yeah all i want to do is be an equipment operator and that's cool man i know guys like that i know a guy that he had the opportunity to run run the show for a big company and he's he's probably pushing late 60s and he still shows up every day hops in motor grader or track hoe and he's operating every single day and that's what he wants to do he could retire and he makes good money he could retire but he doesn't want to because he likes it. And he even had the, the head guy position. He did it for a few weeks. And he said, he said, this isn't what I want to do. I don't want to do it. I don't like it. And I want to go back to just operating and being a foreman. And that's what it was. And that's what, he, that's what he did. And he was happy with it. He didn't want his name on the door. But, you know, he's still smart. And he still got, you know, makes good money, financially free. And he's not an idiot. And he's happy with what he's doing there. So everybody's long-term goals are different. I mean, not everybody wants to own the place or whatever, but, but just being to that point where you are living that life you want to live. Maybe you've tried a few things and didn't like it, but you know that you're where you want to be. Nothing's better than that. I mean, my ultimate goal is to be out of construction completely. Eventually. Um, my ultimate goal is to have a gun range, a wedding venue and some cows. That's about it. That's a broad, that's a broad thing, man. Come on, <laughs> you are gun range a wedding venue. Get married with us. <laughs> we well, put a whole new meaning to shotgun wedding. We're, we're gonna try to do it where we buy a good plot, and you know we put the venue in one spot, and then we have the farm itself in another, and but it's all tied together. But they'd be separate, you know, and we'd zone it that way. But it'd be so you don't have to have to really leave. You know, you could just jump in the gator or whatever, and. You know, and you go down the wedding venue, you go down the wedding venue, you know, it's just, it's a plan that I got, you know, and I, I, I just want that. I, I want my mom and my dad are both self-employed and, uh, growing up, they weren't home a lot. And so it was me and my brothers. So for me, it's kind of like, I don't want that for my kids. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want them to, yes, I get to work with my mom now every day. It's awesome. Don't get me wrong. I talk to her on the phone every day now and stuff, but it's only, 
it's always about work a lot of times. And then at night we talk personal stuff, but you know, I want it where I can be that dad that drops the kid off at school, pick him up from school and coach the football team. You know, I can do that kind of stuff. And being in the industry we're in, it's very hard to do that. It really is. Um, and like you're talking about that financial freedom. Oh, if you, you know, if I did enough things that can make it where I could do that, I'm going to do that, you know, and eventually step away from this. I will, you know, and I, I've already accepted that it, it doesn't bother me. And, you know, I, I, I would prefer that. Um, this it's an awesome, it's been an awesome journey doing what I'm doing now. And, you know, I don't want to do it forever though. Yeah. And I know what you mean by that, dude. Like I love what I do, but it, it, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, construction, it, it, it is a hard industry. I mean, it's, it's a ball kicking industry. And I mean, you know me, man, I'm all for it. I'm trying to push people to go into it. We still need people to join the trades. Um, but I think any venture gets like that. And, and my, my tunes changed a lot. I mean, a year and a half ago, I was I wasn't trying to leave the industry, but I was I was looking at getting a different role in the industry for different types of people or start my own deal. And I mean, but now I'm like, no, I actually really love what I do. Like I've tried some of that other stuff, and now it's like, oh no, this this is this is where I want to be for right now. I mean, I don't know if I want to show up and work ten to twelve hours a day for another fifty years, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm happy with it right now. Um, Sure. I, I, I'd like to have more time off at some point. Um, and right now that just doesn't allow me to do so. But again, that's where I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm making money in other places and doing things on other side ventures that fulfill me and make it to where, okay, yeah, I don't have enough PTO to take off an extra three or four days or a couple of Fridays or whatever, whatever. I don't care. I mean, I, if I, I did, miss if my I day. did stay in the industry, um, the way I would do it was it would be all real work. You know, I, I would be like, I'd put, I'd have the, you know, the website and a little Google page and, you know, I'd be in like all the farmers dailies and at the tractor supply, little business card up, you know, it'd be skid steer and dozer service, you know, have a little tandem dump truck, a little pull trailer can pull my dozer around and skid steer and right. bid enough work to pay the bills and pay myself decently and only got to work a couple days a week Dude. and i know guys that are like that they, yeah, i know guys like that too man i know a con he works till noon every day he's i mean he's probably in his 70s but yeah. he'll work he, he's off at noon every day he only does concrete pours five five yards or less and he's got him and two other old guys that work for him and that's what they do man yeah and I got a guy, I was about to tell you this. I got a guy that literally, he only works technically three days. He bids for one. Mm -hmm. So he goes and bids jobs on Mondays. He does the jobs he bid that Monday on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. He takes a three-day weekend. There you go. So he services the machine on Friday morning, a couple hours, you know, wash him, whatever he's doing, do some stuff in his shop. And then he's done. He jumps on his Harley all weekend. Yeah. And that's what he does. And... and you know, and on Monday, it's not a hard day for them because nobody wants you coming to their house at 7 o'clock in the morning and come look at something. They want you there between, like, 9 and 12, you know, so he's not having to get up, like, super early anyways. Yeah. So it's – he's got a good life. He's got a good gig. And, you know, I told him, I said, you know, I, I'd love to get to that because he was, at one point, like us, he was in a – he worked – had owned a larger company and sold it. And I don't remember if he sold it or closed it down, but – he took a couple years off and then he started doing that. And he's like, dude, I'm so much happier. My stress level is, I have no stress hardly anymore. Mm -hmm. He's like, I know how to write the quote, you know, because he got all experience from doing commercial work. He knows how to write the quote. He knows how to play the game. He gets his money up front. He don't, he don't, he don't play with these. He don't play the games. He just, if you can pay 50% up front and 50% when I'm done. That's it. You know, and there's guys like that, like me, dude. I want to be the biggest and I want to be the best. I mean, like yeah. I'm, I'm looking, I mean, for me enough is never enough kind of thing. Like I'm, I'm a hardcore, I'm going to go far in life. I want to be a billionaire type guy. That's me. Yeah. But I know the concrete guy that he makes enough to pay his bills and buy beer every weekend. And 
He works till noon every day, not even every day, maybe three to four days a week, you know, and in the summer, maybe he works five days a week, but in the winter, he may work one or two, like, you know, that's how he lives. And, and the trades offers you that. That's what's cool about what we do. Like, man, I know a guy that he's a big supporter of my show. You know, I talked to him one day and he's like, yeah, dude, I make pretty good money on the side. He works for like a gas company. They do like specialty work on gas lines. And he goes, yeah, dude, uh, I make, I make good money on the side. I don't really want to do that full time. I work like 40 hours to 50 hours at my job. I go do this side stuff. I might work 10 hours a week. I have my own little excavator and I do this stuff. And he said, I'm happy there. If my job's slow, then I pick up a little bit more work on the side. And, you know, it's no big deal. It's cool. Like I'm working as much as I want to work and I don't overwork myself. Sometimes I, you know, it's just a good balance. And I like doing the stuff for myself. I don't want to do it full time. I don't want to do big stuff. I don't want to scale and grow. And that's what's cool, man, is you can be that guy that you're making just enough to pay the bills. And you can be the guy that has a thousand employees and you're the biggest dick in the state. You know what I mean? Like there's so many different avenues you can go down in, in this industry. And that's the beauty of being a business owner is you have to realize, and this is where a lot of business owners go wrong is they get a few good jobs. And then all of a sudden people say, well, I want you to work for me. And then all of a sudden you go from you, let's say you're a three man crew. Now all of a sudden you blow up and you hire a whole bunch of guys and you've got 15 guys and you're on three different jobs at one time. And you did it within a matter of a month, you went from three to 15 and now you're trying to manage all this. You don't know how to do it. You don't realize how much payroll is every week. And it's so hard to make the ends meet and you're so stressed all the time. And then you know, all of a sudden, oh shit, now I've got to scale down because this just isn't working. And then you scale back down Then you go, I'm really happy here. And maybe you either slowly scale back up to be bigger, or maybe you just say, dude, I'm happy staying within 20 miles of my house. I've got me and two other employees. I make enough money to afford the lifestyle I care to live. I don't need to have a freaking Lamborghini and a private jet. I'm just good right here. And you can do that, man. You can be anywhere you want, any size you want. And, you know, that's that's the beauty of it. Yeah. I, it's crazy you just talked about that, that, you know, my circumstance, the reason that I've had to shrink is not caused on my own half. It's literally dealing with issues on jobs and people just not paying you. Mm -hmm. And... It stinks if you've got the backing, man, and you want to go get get big, you know. Bring people in that know their stuff, man, you know. And uh, Trump, whatever people's opinions about him, dude knows his business. And he always says when he starts a business or he creates a new company, he says, I bring in people that are smarter than me. Mm -hmm. And that's what he does. And that's why he's very successful. Yeah. And you got to you got to check the ego at the door and when you when you want to grow a company like you're talking about and you want to go have the lamborghini and the the jets and all that bring in people that know know what the hell they're doing and pay them handsomely and i promise you you'll build a badass company oh yeah but also make sure the people you're working for are good people Mm -hmm. You know, and, and everybody can preach, you know, watch who you work for, watch who you work for. Call other people, man. That That's the best way to find out how these people operate. Because if you call 10 contractors and nine of them say, hey, man, I didn't have a single issue with the guy. And then one guy goes, man, they didn't pay me, blah, 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 da, 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 da. Well, if the one guy that didn't get paid, he probably the guy that had problems with him. And the reason he had problems with him was they had disagreement about the job. He did some work that they didn't approve and he thought he was going to get paid for. I mean, there's so many different variables. But my point to all this is bring in people that know their stuff. Yeah. That are going to hold each other accountable because you want a team that's going to hold each other accountable. And I tell my guys all the time, I'm like, dude, if I'm screwing up, you need to tell me. And they're like, you're the boss. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> if I screw up, I want to know because I'm not perfect. I'm a human being just like you. I make mistakes. Yeah. No one's perfect. I don't care who they are. I don't care. Everyone screws up. Yeah. And 
Oh, go ahead. Oh, you're good, bro. It's just, you know, check the ego, man, and just try to try to navigate these waters, man. And I'll tell you all something. The construction, like you said, man, it, it, it can be a, a real kick in the ass. And you're not going to learn in this game by by sitting there being scared all the time. If you are, you're, you're just not gonna you're not gonna get anywhere with it. But now I'm not saying don't be risk adverse either, though, because you're leveraging a lot when you go on a job. You're leveraging a lot. You're coming out of pocket for labor. You're coming out of pocket for fuel, machinery. If you got to have special materials delivered, you know you're you're already out some money. And the thing that stinks is even if you don't get paid, all that's still got to get paid. Because you don't pay your guys, you don't have operators. You don't pay the equipment payments. The equipment company comes and takes your stuff. You don't. <laughs> you don't pay the suppliers. You ain't gonna get pipe or dirt or whatever on the next job. And so, it's a gamble, and you gotta be you gotta be conscientious of that. And and, and you gotta really know who you're working for. And word of mouth's the best. It's just like getting business, but checking it goes both ways. You know, GCs call each other. They talk about trades. They're like, hey, man, I got this job coming up. You know, you guys recommend, man, we use these guys on all our jobs. They're awesome. Well, call other dirt contractors or whatever you, paving contractor, concrete contractor, whatever person's in your trade. Call your call your competitors and be like, hey, if you guys ever work for these guys, yeah, I have. They're good. Yeah. If the consensus is they're good, you're probably going to be okay. If you hear mixed reviews, be careful. You know, yeah, that's the, that's, I can give uh, on that. the guy I had just uh, our most recent guest, uh, Taylor uh, Hodge, he was he's actually done that. Um, you know, he's an operator, dude. He wants to operate. Mm -hmm. Well, he owns he owns his company and he hired a guy like he just he was doing the bidding and trying to do the, the management stuff. And, and he was kind of what I was talking about earlier. You know, he was telling me stories about like he's a good old boy. You know, he'd do all this extra stuff, never ask for anything more and wouldn't get paid for it or whatever. And he. You know, but he uh, he hired somebody to be a project manager and, you know, estimator for him. And basically that's been his whole thing is he goes, dude, that guy's been my saving grace. He goes, now I can like, you know, operate equipment, lead the crew. He owns the company. He's out in the field running equipment, leading the crew. And then he's got his guy that does all the back office stuff, project management, estimating and stuff. And they've got a good relationship where, I mean, he might come out on site and he might tell this guy how to do the job. He might come out as a project manager and say, dude, you need to stop doing this and you need to do that. And I saw him do it the other day on a job site. And it was like, damn son, like that guy owns the company and like you're telling him kind of how to do it, but he listens to him because he knows that he's smarter than him in those yeah. aspects. And yeah. it's like, wow. And and that's another thing, dude. You know, you can be, you can have your name on the door and still run a piece of equipment. I think that a lot of people don't realize that. I know? do it every day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go to the office anymore, hardly. I uh, I get yelled at by my project manager and my estimator at least weekly. Yeah. And I'm not afraid to admit it. Pete gets in my ass about something. My mom will get in my ass about something. They're like, hey, did you authorize this? Yeah. We don't got money for that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I it, it is what it is. You know, it's um, you know, I I kind of when we when we downsized, I went. You know, I need to be out in the field. I need to run these jobs. I need to be on the ground because that's how it's going to get us healthy again and rolling in the right direction. Is me being back out there, breeding the culture the way I want it, building the the crews on why I want them, yeah. getting front, getting my form in the way I want them, and it's really been working and we're doing really good and we're making it work with less and it's kind of been fun yeah. as weird as it sounds like today i was out there with devin and uh ruben group love those guys shout out my co-host and they're set we're setting manholes for we're uh you know set a manhole with them help them do that you know it was it was awesome you know and we had rain out here all day and we dry, he helped me dry it out and get it ready for trucks for tomorrow. I mean, but we're working together and you know, it just, 
it brought back so many things that I missed about being out there that I'm like, man, that's why I love this stuff. And I remember what I did it for in the beginning because, you know, a few episodes ago, Devin said it best. He's like, man, you build these companies up and you get in the office and you get so far away from what you're actually, you were trying to do and you begin to hate it. And I did. Dude, and, that's what a lot of people do, man, is they, they, in anything, man, I mean, this is kind of deep, you know, they lose themselves. And I mean, I, I, I did that early on in my career. I did that up until probably the last year. I mean, you know, you lose yourself in it, man. You get caught up trying to be a quote businessman, business owner. What you don't realize is that nobody, none of us know what the fuck we're doing. None of us, no, no one, no one knows what the fuck they're doing in life. And if anybody tells you that they do, they're full of shit. There's things that get dropped on anybody. I mean, you don't realize how hard life is until certain things come up. You don't know how hard marriage is until you get married. You don't know how hard being a parent is until it happens. I haven't had that yet, but I know it's going to be hard when it happens. Uh, you know, you don't realize how hard being a project manager. I mean, there's times where I'm like cruising. Great, dude. Life could not be better. And then all of a sudden something happens. You're like, What do I do now? I don't know. None of us know. And you lose yourself in that. So it's so easy to lose yourself in that process because you're trying to put the facade on because you think other people know what the hell they're doing. And so you try to present like, you know what the hell you're doing, but then you learn, Oh, nobody, nobody knows. And whenever you lose yourself, whenever you lose what you believe in, what you stand for and what you love about it, then you're just miserable. Cause you're not, now you're not motivated to show up to work because you hate being there. You know, now you're not motivated to, to build your business because you hate the business, like, because it, it's created a life that you don't want to live. And that's what people need to realize is whether you work for somebody or you're starting a company or you own the company you have for years, you've got to be happy, dude. I, I know that there's a lot of hustle stuff like, man, you're going to get kicked in the nuts all the fucking time owning a business and you will, or running one. And but people don't realize that that's just part of it, man. And you have to learn to love the pain. You have to learn to love those struggles, but you have to learn what's going to keep me happy during those struggles. And like, for me, dude, I've had way more workload than I've ever had the last few months, but like I've balanced it because, all right, I've got my stuff on the side that I go tinker with after hours. Like, you know me, I'm in my band. I, I've, I've, I've learned to be myself that's why I started growing my hair back out and doing stuff like that because I'm like, this is me, man. This is real. This is raw. Dude, I've gotten a lot more work because of it because now I'm yeah. myself. I'm not being somebody I'm not. Even though, you know, I, in the industry, I get judged a lot for having long hair and being, f you know, fucking hippie or whatever. But, uh, you know, but but people like me because I'm a real dude and I'm a real person. Yep. I'm not miserable because I'm I'm expressing myself and I'm being myself and in every setting possible. And, and you're going to get the same me in this meeting that you are in that meeting. Now I might tone it up or down a little bit, but also what it is is like, I've been going and like, I enjoy working in the field. I don't want to work in the field every single day. That's why I went to college. You know what I mean? Like I, that's why I learned to be a project manager. I love working in the field. I love being with those guys. You have to stay grounded with them. So like the last several months I've been out on the asphalt crew laying asphalt here and there, you know, and especially while we were shorthanded, I was out there once or twice a week for full days. Did I have time for that? No. But because I did that, I'm a lot better at my job now. So yep. you got to be yourself and, and you've got to stay grounded. And if, if you're not doing that, you're not going to be a good project manager or estimator. If you're trying to be somebody you're not and you're not also getting out there in, in the field and staying grounded. Stop being a fucking bully too, man. For real. All these guys now, man, they're like fucking school kids. I'm serious, man. Some of these guys, you can tell they got they never got their fucking ass kicked when they were a kid. Well, it's because they're it's because they are unhappy with their own lives. It's what I just said. You know, people act like that because they're not happy. Like, dude, me, I'm always in a good mood because yeah. because I'm living my dream, man. I mean, seriously, like like I have good days and I have bad days. I struggle with, you know, things like depression and all that all the time. But overall, I'm me, man. You're going to yep. see me. I'm going to I'm gonna come up to you. I'm going to shake your hand. I'm going to say hi to you. I'm going to be happy to see you. I'm going to smile at you. Whether I'm at work and there's major problems going on, I'm the kind of guy that, like, we could be at my best friend's funeral, 
I might be crying one second, but I'm going to lean over to you the next second and make a joke about him being dead or something. You know what I mean? Like, that's just, that's who I am. And yep. you have to act like that all the time. You have to just be yourself and not, not try to fit somebody else's mold. It's really, it really is crazy how some people, they, they can't separate the still being a human being. Yeah. They, they just like, they have to be right. You know, I'm a robot, you know, blah, blah, blah. This is the way. Okay. Whatever, man. I've learned what those I've learned with those guys over the years. Just make them feel like they're almighty and yeah. worship the ground they walk on and usually you get whatever you need from them and that's about the end of it. But exactly. But you know, those are the guys with five divorces and mm -hmm. their kids hate them and you know it's like, you know, th those are the guys that they act hard because that's all they know because they're insecure and they, they have no humility in their life and, no. and they're not themselves. They don't know how to be themselves. They just, all they know is, you know, I make the most money here or, or I'm, I'm the boss. You know, they, they need something to make them feel like they have a big dick whenever they don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little way you say shit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so are you a grower not a shower i mean what are we talking to? <laughs> I'm it smaller hands dude don't take it out oh, on me God, dude what the fuck bro <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck dude dude i gotta tell you man like we're way past my bedtime but... me too dude <laughs> <laughs> nine o'clock we're both like man i'm ready to go to bed dude no shit yeah, it's a school night for us you gonna get my balls kicked in that's been like my last two weeks so yeah it's i've been it, yeah bedtime i'm Sunday. making an hour and 15 minute drive to the, the job i'm running right now because david this is hilarious i'm driving past the job that david's running every day to go to the job i'm running and the job he's running is like 15 minutes from my house so I'll be driving there and they're not even at the job yet because, you know, I got to leave so damn early and I drive by it and I go, yep, I still got 45 minutes. <laughs> you up another dirty and driven episode. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. So, uh, let's, uh, let's get your some love for the dirty and driven everyone if you could uh check them out they're on spotify apple itunes pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast right anywhere should be if it's not yeah. you know but you guys are on youtube now right yeah yeah we've been on youtube for a few months now so oh, that's awesome yeah if you want to watch us there um i'm not a guy who watches podcasts but if you are then it's there awesome um so james how can we reach you buddy uh you can follow me at any major social media um instagram tiktok facebook at dirty and driven uh you can follow me personally if you want to at jl Divini. uh dirty and driven.com you can contact us uh we you know if, if any of this resonated with you and you're like shit dude i i don't know how to become a good leader in this industry or i i, I could use some guidance uh you know dirty and driven we're a podcast and we're a training company and we work with businesses uh to help you develop a gain train retain plan uh if that's something that you think's in your business is uh you know we help you figure out how to funnel people people in we really focus on the training part um leadership training uh setting up a training pipeline you know some of the stuff like brandon and i talked about today of in the interview asking guys their goals and helping them work towards it well basically setting that framework up is really uh where we specialize in that and then helping you retain your people hey how can we Make some small changes in your business that's going to make sure that your guys are loyal to you and they want to stick around and they're happy where they're at. Um, things like culture development, things like that. You know, it's a lot of stuff. But if any of that sounds good to you as a business owner, let me know. I'd love to work with you. Um, or if you're a project manager or you're a foreman or you're a superintendent and you go, man, uh, my company ain't doing that, but I sure wish I had that training. Well, hit me up too, and, and uh, I'm happy to do some one-on-one -on -one stuff. So uh, anyways, that's my plug for the business stuff. But otherwise, if you want to hear a podcast that's mainly nonsense, but it is kind of along the theme of construction, then uh, check out the Dirty and Driven podcast. <laughs>
it's not quite as serious as what we talked about today <laughs> yeah we we do have fuck off episodes sometimes oh yeah don't we all man but hey yeah. man it's good to talk about this stuff you know sometimes it's fun to fuck off and sometimes it's it's fun to get deep and i tried to do this season i was like you know i'm gonna go try and go deep for a little bit beginning of the season get everybody kind of back in the groove with us going again and you know i'll throw a fuck off episode here and there yeah me and, me and Devin will talk shit or something whenever but, you make your way up to oklahoma we can have a real oh, it's gonna, episode. It's gonna, it's gonna be a banger. I already know it. Oh yeah. Uh, well, anyways, guys, uh, it's past my bedtime. Um, even if you're probably gonna let, know, knowing most of you people listening are gonna be listening to this at like five o'clock in the morning. But um, thank you for the love and support for us coming back. We are averaging between five and a thousand downloads a week again. 500 and 1,000 downloads a week, uh, which is awesome. Um, really, truly love the support. If you haven't yet, please go on our Instagram and like and follow us. Um, we're going to be giving a, doing a 500 follower giveaway. We're going to be sending you a hat. And then the 1,000, we're going to be sending you a custom hoodie and a custom hat and a sticker. So uh, you guys want to do that, uh, check us out. Um, like, rate, and review on Spotify uh apple um give us our five stars on spotify if you're watching us on youtube please like share and subscribe and hit the notification bell and uh that's really all i got uh devin wanted me to pass along uh thanks for all the love and support for the show he will be back next episode um so if you are interested in being a guest on the show please shoot me an email at ongrade88 at gmail.com and i will get back to you also, if you still are wanting those temperate sheets, I still have them. Uh, just shoot me an email. I'll be more than happy to send it over to you. And uh, that's really all I got, brother. You got anything else you want to talk about real quick? Cool, man. I just find it funny that Devin's missed like two episodes and both of them are whenever I'm on. I know. Well, no, he was <laughs> on the phone with you. Uh, well, kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's I know. service, though. We'll, we'll, we'll do one of these days. One of these days, we'll, we'll be on the same schedule. Yeah, we'll all line up. I, I was sad too. I, I gotta give a I gotta give a plug to my boy KCD. You know, he's my co-host and he was supposed to be on tonight, but he worked shift work and uh doing doing a seven PM episode just was was out of the question for him today, unfortunately. But uh we'll we'll get him on here. He needs to he needs to be a guest on some other podcast. He's he's too good of a he he's just too good of a of a person and too funny to not be behind that microphone on other people's shows yeah i'm really looking forward to meeting him man you know i've messaged him and stuff like that never actually talked to him on the phone yet but i'm looking forward to getting up to oklahoma and seeing him and uh i do got to make one oklahoma joke before we sign off so you can make a texas joke all right do you know what's the best thing they ever put in oklahoma what southbound 35 <laughs> dude funny story. can i tell a funny story about that i know we're yeah, right go ahead. So back in, I don't know what year it was. It's whenever Alfalfa Bill Murray was the mayor, uh, governor of Oklahoma. Texas put up a toll bridge between over the Red River. And this is before the interstates and all that. It's a long time. Yeah. Well, Texas put up a toll bridge over the Red River, and they were charging everybody who came into Texas a toll. So Alfalfa Bill Murray builds a bridge right next to it that's free. <laughs> so, I don't, I don't, people don't. So people, you know, you know, you always hear about rivalries, you know, and stuff. I'm going to tell you all something, man. There is a huge unwritten rivalry between people from Texas and Oklahoma, and it is hilarious. And it's never, it's never bad. It's just, it's just jabs, you know, and you always go up to Oklahoma and you know when you're in the casino they're like let me guess you're from Texas and you're like <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah. well do you know why Oklahoma's so windy uh, because Texas, Texas blows. blows and Kansas sucks <laughs> <laughs> all right one more all right you know why birds fly upside down in Oklahoma why what now why why do birds fly upside down in Oklahoma why ain't nothing worth shitting on <laughs> you know you know what's actually wild is uh our our lieutenant governor was telling us uh whenever i was in that meeting that i talked about at the beginning of the episode he said uh 
I was actually really surprised by this. He goes, yeah, we don't even think of Texas as like competition. Like Texas is their own thing. Like they're, bi they're way bigger than us. They have more major cities like blah, 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 blah. They're not comparable. They're like, they're like you Oklahomans. You guys might think that Texas is our biggest rival, but they're like, nah, dude, uh, Arkansas. I was like, what Arkansas? <laughs> Arkansas is our enemy. I was like, "How dare you!" My whole life, I've been making fun of Texas and Kansas, and thought Arkansas was like, you know, our cousin next door, like cool dude, blah blah. Now I'm like, oh, so now I gotta hate Arkansas too. All right. <laughs> That's great, dude. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. On that note, uh, guys, uh, thanks for every listening to the show and appreciate it. And uh, James, dude, it's been an absolute freaking pleasure having you on tonight, man. As always, it's, fun, man. Dude, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, man. I'm trying to get up there soon. So, oh yeah. All right, buddy. Everybody, stay classy and uh, stay uh, stay vigilant. And uh, it's been a weird time lately in the world, but everybody, just keep your family tight and. Take care of your guys and take care of each other, man. That's what we need to start doing in this world. We all got to start watching out for each other more, and oh, yeah. uh, especially in our community in the blue collar world. Oh, yeah. So stay humble, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks, guys.